Our first major phylum that we're going to cover in the paleontology class is an odd one, uh, the phylum Bryozoa, and you'll find it in chapter 13. It's the second half of that chapter, and those are the relevant pages. You see it's not very much there. These are small creatures as individuals, but collectively they build colonies that do qualify as macrofossils, things we can see. So a little bit about the general sort of information here. They are one of the phyla that did not originate in the Cambrian. They actually originate in the Ordovician, and they've been going ever since. So they have a long fossil record. They are benthic epifaunal creatures, so they live on the bottom. Uh, they are mostly marine, although we do have some freshwater ones. And when I say there that they are immobile colonies, um, they are mostly immobile. There are a couple of species that can actually move around, but for the most part, anything we will deal with, or most people anywhere, will be immobile, cemented to the substrate colonies. They are all colonies. Uh, one of the other important features about them is that this little structure you see in the upper picture sticking up into the upper right is the lophophore, and that is their suspension feeding and oxygen gathering organ. So this little thing unfurls out of the body and whips around in the water and grabs small particles to eat, and at the same time there is oxygen exchange across that tissue. There's no scale on that thing, sorry, but the scale of these things is very small. So an actual individual zoid, that's the name of a single individual, is, you know, a, a big one reaches about a millimeter in diameter. But really, you look at these things and as soon as they sort of establish themselves, they immediately begin cloning. So look at the lower photograph. There's a colony of these things. Uh, they all have the same exact genetic makeup. They are genuine clones, and the clones themselves can grow into colonies that have um, a size that's several centimeters in diameter. Another slide showing basically the same thing, except this time in cartoon form, and you see all of the uh, detailed anatomical structure that one can get from these things. Uh, sadly, though, there aren't a lot of people that study them either as the biological living specimens or from fossils. The only reason we study them typically as fossils is because they grow a communal skeleton that does get well preserved in the fossil record, mostly because it has a calcium carbonate mineralogy. So since individuals are so small to study, we usually just look at the colonies. Let's look at their evolutionary history in this diagram, and uh, you'll see, uh, again, geologic time is the y-axis, and then the major groups are shown as these vertical columns. Um, many different groups um, re have been recognized, and this is at the order or ordinal level. But the two that have the biggest fossil record I put stars by, the Trepostomata and the Fenestrata, both of which you see here are extinct, but they have the best fossil record. So first the order Trepostomata, or division to Triassic, uh, they typically grow these long tubular zoid sections. Uh, the little circles here sh show thin section slices so you can see this, and I hope to have a slide or two out so you can see them under the microscope. They grow these big, massive, calcitic colonies, and they grow them in vastly different shapes. So what you're seeing here is a branched, upright shape, but it's not always the case. And in fact, you can have the same species that, um, depending upon what environment it's growing in, can have vastly different shapes. The other thing I want to point out here again is that, the, look in the upper right picture, the object you're looking at here is the whole colony, and every one of the little dots you see on there is a little hole in that colony in which one of those zoids lived. And every organism, every zoid there is a clone of its immediate neighbors. 
The other major order is the order Fenestrata, and this is another group that has a mostly Paleozoic distribution. Uh, they have these tubular zoids, but really they are known for their delicate fan-shaped colonies. So several images here, and one of the things I always tell people is you find them and they look like their fossil check cereal because the colony will grow a delicate fan-like structure with these sort of vertical columns and horizontal strut supports. Uh, the holes you see here, students a lot of times are confused. They think, oh, the animals lived in each of these little holes. Well, no, those are just windows in which the, the, the colony is not built, and so water can whoosh through. Look at the cartoon in the lower left. You see the little windows, and on one side it's solid. On the other side, you see the little black dots on the actual solid portion. That's where the zoids live. I told you these things were small, didn't I? Um, and so these are a group that is typically found or is diagnostic of one type of environment and trepostomes the other. And the quickest and simplest way to describe the difference is that in quiet, low-energy environments, bryozoans grew to delicate, tall, multiply branching colonies, and we usually have some pretty good preservation of these. Even if they're all broken, you have some detailed features. The contrasting um, environment would be a rapid, high energy, crashing waves, high fast currents, and here they grow the more robust uh, encrusting type colonies. The preservation here can be fair, but it can also be poor. In general, fenestrates, the order fenestrata, grow in quiet environments. And in general, trepostomes grow in high energy environments, although there's obviously exceptions to each rule. Your book has an interesting set of figures. Um, you see here, there's, there's just many, many letter designations here and all the different growth forms. What I especially like about this particular diagram is on the right side of each picture, it shows the sort of living colony and then to the left, or excuse me, on the left side, and then to the right, it shows what they look like as commonly preserved. So look, for instance, at this D, palmate. You see a branching upright structure and it breaks and makes these gravel sized pieces like this. Um, trepostomes are typically found as all of these morphologies except E and F, which are the fenestrates. And so there's A through F on this slide. And then the next slide also includes G, H, I, and um, J. And again, one finds bryozoans as all of these broken bits of material. This then leads us to a practical approach to dealing with them. Since most people are not experts on bryozoan biology or paleobiology, we use them more for their environmental indicator uh, value. And so what we do is if you have a pile of these in your collections, you've sampled somewhere and you're trying to determine the paleoecology, of the community. Uh, you can't ignore them. They're important components of the species, uh, but you can't count them like other things. So what we do is we simply count the colonies. We note the different colonial shapes and colony types, and then we will measure the maximum length of these things. To get some measure, you get, now notice what you get here, you get taxonomic composition and you get some measure of how broken up they are, which can be a proxy for how destructive the environment is. Just another slide saying basically the same thing. They are a common component in calcareous rocks of the Paleozoic. They are also very important reef builders for certain uh, specialized reefs and they are co-travelers with a lot of other important groups like the brachiopods, crinoids, corals, and mollusks that we'll talk about later. Now one thing about them, so the, the lower picture is counting um, fragments and I gave you a practical approach for that. The upper picture 
is an abalone shell and the thing that's growing and coating all over the top of it is a horizontally growing or laterally extending um, colony. If you think about all the little teeny tiny holes here, you're talking about tens of thousands of individuals, clones, that collectively have built this skeleton on here. Well, one of the questions that's come up or years ago when we were studying these things is, why don't they just keep growing? Why don't we have giant bryozoan colonies like we do for corals or sponges or something like that? They typically grow a colony, they reach a certain size, and then stop. And to answer this question, we look at their biology of feeding, in particular how they do it. And so that colony sitting right there, the little lophophores of all of those clones get out, they start spinning and vibrating, and they generate a pumping velocity. So they literally suck water in, they pump it in at a certain velocity. The water doesn't leave right there, it travels through the whole colony and leaves out the sides. That is the escape velocity. And one of the things they discovered is that the escape velocity is much higher than the pumping velocity that any one particular zoid um, can make. And uh, clearly then there's some kind of uh, additive or multiplicative uh, factor going on where all the individual little uh, clones move water in at a certain speed but then as a colony, they are ejecting it out the sides at a much higher rate. And that's what the lab is going to be this week, uh, examining the mathematics of the flow velocities to give us some idea of the reason why colonies of bryozoans don't grow to giant size. So the next few slides are relevant for the lab that you're going to be doing this week. Uh, and it lays out in simple form the basic multiplication of factors that you're going to do to get some estimate on velocities, volume of water, and size limitations. So, basic assumptions. Assume that those little teeny tiny lophophore tentacles extend about 0.02 centimeters above the colony. So you're again, you're looking at the millimeter scale here, but let's put it in centimeters so the units are easily um, multiplied and divided. Uh, that's pretty small. And then those little things for individual zoids have an average pumping velocity, so small letter V, of about 0.4 centimeters per second. In the cartoon below, you see the substrate, that's the benthic bottom. You see a little colony, every one of these little uh, curvy objects with what look like two little antennae. Those are actually the lophophores. That's an individual zoid. The little lowercase v is the velocity of water that they are pumping in. The large uppercase v is the velocity of the water that's going out. And you see here that the velocity begins small and it gets larger and larger till it reaches the edge of the colony and it's spewing out at a much higher rate. The volume escaping from the lateral margins of the colony, so the amount of water that's going out, is calculated as the simple formula, just taking the pumping velocity, 0.4 centimeters per second, times pi times the radius of the whole colony. The colonies typically will approximate a circle, and so if the entire sort of width of this thing is the diameter, then the half distance is the radius, and so that value r squared. And so you're going to be calculating q for various sizes in the lab. If you look at a simple example, if you have a colony, where we've measured the diameter as 8 centimeters, well then the radius, by definition, is just 4 centimeters. And so the formula becomes just a simple plug and chug like this. The velocity, lowercase v, is 0.4 centimeters per second, times pi, 3.1416, times the radius, 4 centimeters squared, 
and here we get a Q value of 20.1 cubic centimeters each second spewing out the side here. Now one of the things you're going to note when you're doing this is that as the colony size gets larger, this Q value is also going to get larger, larger, larger. So you're going to calculate a bunch of these and then plot them on a graph and look at that distribution. To calculate the velocity of how fast the water is leaving, the escape velocity, or uppercase V, uh, that's going to be, since it's a velocity, it's going to be in centimeters per second. That is a simple calculation of Q, which you just calculated in the previous slide, divided by A, which is the area. And so A, in this case, is pi times the diameter times the height, which is the height of that loaf of four tentacle sheath which is typically something very small. It's about 0.02 centimeters, and all of that's given for you. So a V, or escape velocity calculation, would be something like this. For that same colony where we just calculated Q, you've got that in the bank. There's Q, 20.1 cubic centimeters per second. If we go to calculate the escape velocity, we have that 20.1 cubic centimeters per second, then divided by the area, which is pi, 3.1416, times the diameter, 8 centimeters, times the height, h, or 0.02 centimeters. So that's 20.1 divided by 0.5, and you end up with a vol an escape velocity of 40.2 centimeters. Remember, the input or the pumping velocity was just 0.4 centimeters. And the escape velocity is much larger at 40.2 centimeters. So I just want you to think before we actually do calculations on this, as the colony size is getting larger than that escape velocity is also going to get extreme. And that's going to be the constraint on the growth of these colonies.